second. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about my work today. Um, just in the spirit of Science on Tap, getting to know other groups at the center. Um, just a little background. I'm from the MR Pigs group, as we like to call ourselves, uh, Larry Wald's group. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, that we do in the group. Uh, there are some pictures of more interesting hardware projects down here uh, than what I do. If uh, you're curious about any of these things, feel free to ask me. I could um, recommend you some other people. Um, so we do a lot of brain imaging, and my research is under the area of different uh, acquisition and reconstruction techniques to improve and speed up neuroimaging. Um, what I work on specifically is motion correction. I'm guessing that most people in this room <laughs> know that motion can be a big problem uh, when you're doing an MRI scan. Um, and so this image here on the left uh, is from a healthy subject acquired uh, from day one this summer. It's using a, a standard Siemens clinical brain protocol. So this is something that you would see every day in the clinic. Um, and on the left is what it looks like when the subject is still. And on the right uh, is what happens when there's patient motion. Uh, and this sort of motion can really affect imaging. You can't see certain anatomical features. Um, and often uh, in the clinic, you have to sedate or anesthetize patients, which really increases the risk. Um, or you need to repeat scans. And studies have shown that around 20% of all MR scans that um, happen in hospitals, this is based on a case study out of the University of Washington, just have to be completely uh, repeated. Um, and the worst case scenario is potentially if you don't repeat the scan and there are artifacts and then a radiologist just reads through artifacts. So uh, because of all these um, issues with patient motion and MRI, um, there have been a lot of different techniques to try and compensate and mitigate motion artifacts. Um, so I'm gonna try and keep it brief today. I'm not gonna talk about those specifically, but if anyone's curious, feel free to let me know. Um, what I'm gonna do is talk about our approach, um, which, uh, is sort of specific to neuroimaging and some of the problems that uh, we see there. And so since we're mostly looking at brain imaging, uh, first of all, we're going to restrict ourselves to correcting for rigid motion. You can also look at non-rigid motion. That's essential if you're doing something like body imaging or cardiac imaging. Um, but for the brain, we're assuming we have a rigid model. Um, and so assuming that there's a rigid motion in the brain, our strategy to try and correct for this patient motion uh, is to use a retrospective reconstruction technique. So we would acquire the data um, exactly as is being done already today in the clinic. Um, but during our reconstruction, we would do this joint search. Um, and instead of just looking for our image unknowns, which is what we normally do, we will also be looking for um, motion parameters. So basically uh, the coordinates of where the position of where the patient was throughout the scan. And then once you have those coordinates, you can reconstruct the image uh, to get something of higher quality. Um, and the way we do that is by minimizing the data consistency error. And the data consistency uh, is essentially a quality metric for how well some reconstruction model you have fits with your actual uh, raw data. And so the advantages of this type of technique is that uh, there are no changes to the clinical workflow. You don't need to add any markers or change the way that you're doing the acquisition now. Um, and no scan modifications are required. So for an acquisition like TurboSpinEco T2 imaging, which is what uh, we're looking at here, um, you're acquiring your data very fast, so it's hard to add in extra navigators uh, or measurements. And so just to give you a visual picture of what retrospective motion correction looks like. Um, so in the standard case, the top row here, what would happen is uh, this is the underlying patient anatomy that we're trying to reconstruct. Uh, we have some case-based data and then these different color arrows uh, represent the sampling that happens in case space, which is how we do our sampling in MR. And if you have a standard encoding model, call it E, an unknown image X, and then your required data S, and you try and invert this problem, uh, you'll get a smooth looking image where you can see all the patient anatomy. However, if your actual acquisition in case space is all jittery due to the fact that the subject was moving, you're going to have uh, ringing and blurring artifacts. And so what we do instead is we try and use uh, a different reconstruction model. So instead of the standard encoding model E, uh, we use what we're calling E theta. And E theta represents that we've added in the motion parameters into our optimization. Uh, and so the goal is to still be able to get a similar image quality even with this um, messed up case space. And so let's skip ahead a little bit. Uh, but so generally doing this sort of inverse problem is a is very difficult. It's um, non-convex, it's non-linear, uh, and if you were to try and do this using standard optimization techniques, it could be on the order of days to do it. Um, 
So we need to use different optimization strategies to make this minimization feasible. And so there are two that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and the first one is from the first acronym on my title slide. It's called TAMER, um, where we're trying to just reduce the size of the optimization problem. We just do these smaller subsets. Um, and then the second is to try and accelerate our reconstruction by incorporating um, machine learning techniques, um, which are a lot faster. So that's what I'll talk about afterwards. So first, uh, reducing the size. So here's another example of a uh, motion corrupted image. So this is a brain phantom, which we took and we just put on a translation stage and we had it move from side to side uh, throughout the scan. And so these are the sorts of artifacts you'll see and the image error we just subtracted from a scan where it wasn't moving. And so since we only want to have a smaller problem, um, we're going to reconstruct it in this band here, which is what we're calling our targeted voxels. And so we can only sort of clean up or mitigate the artifact in this band at any one time if we have a smaller problem. So what we do is we move this band across the image. And I'm just going to play uh, a video for you. And as our target region moves around the image, the corresponding areas in image space are being improved. So it's almost like the target voxels are sweeping across the image and getting rid of artifacts as we're jointly optimizing for the motion. Um, and so this is a, a video sort of how it works generally, um, but this work was published at the beginning of the year in Transactions on Medical Imaging. So if anyone's interested in more of like the mathematical details, um, they're in that paper. Um, and just to show some more results from phantoms, first this is a uh, pineapple. So we put it on the pineapple wobbler, which is another uh, stage where when you sort of twist this little knob, it'll move from side to side. Uh, or it'll rotate in plane and it'll create a blurring in the image. So on the left you have, this is what the image would look like if it just popped up on the scanner uh, when you're sitting there doing the acquisition. But using our reconstruction method, we can get back some of these high frequency features uh, that you couldn't see before. And then an in vivo example, um, this is from neonatal data uh, where the, the subject was moving during the scan. And so some of these streaking artifacts that are going through the brain were able to um, get rid of by using the tamer reconstruction. And so now I'm going to get to um, some more recent results. So these are basically results that I just put in for the ISMRM abstract last week. Uh, so they're very preliminary. If anyone has any sort of input on ways that you think this could be done better or more efficiently, um, we'd love to get different suggestions. Um, so thinking about uh, what machine learning can do, one of its strengths is that it can be very fast. Uh, and we wanted to see if we could pre-train a network to basically try and take out motion artifacts, and then we could use that either to jumpstart our search or to improve upon the iteration as we go. So this is a network that was first constructed by Birkin Billick, uh, who works uh, in our group. And what he created was this uh, convolutional neural network that takes a motion corrupted image as input, and we're using patches. So in this case, 51 by 51 patches. Uh, they go into the network, and then it will output basically what the artifacts are in the image. Um, and so taking this uh, original architecture and then doing some further experimentation, um, we were able to apply this to some simulated motion corrupted data. So on the left are the original images. And then after we apply the CNN, a lot of the artifacts are gone. Um, however, it's not a perfect image, uh, especially in this slice. You can, I don't know how it's coming up on the projector, but there's still clearly some ringing artifacts and some blurring is also introduced. So um, this could be, for many different reasons within our network. Um, but what we're mostly trying to do is just get a general guess that can then help us do a physics-based optimization. And so using this as a first step, um, we have this sort of motion correction loop. So first we have a machine learning based step where we apply this network uh, to get rid of some of the artifacts. And then once we do that, we try and search for the motion parameters. So we're minimizing that data consistency metric I was talking about before, but only changing the motion parameters. So if you assume that you had this cleaner image that we got from a neural network that might not be perfect, it can actually help us learn a lot about what motion happened during the scan. And then once we have a better guess at the motion parameters, we can resolve for all of the image values. And this is akin to standard reconstruction techniques that people are using today in the clinic. And so this is something that, um, people may have a little bit more confidence in, and it's something that isn't necessarily coming from a black box. Um, and so once we output this motion, motion mitigated image, we'll have these data consistency values to go along with them. Um, but without the neural network step, this sort of optimization um, 
potentially be on the order of days or weeks. And right now it's more like minutes or more like hours. So still uh, improvements to be done, but definitely a big speed up by incorporating uh, the neural network. And so I'm gonna skip this slide and just go right to some, or I'll just quickly show this is basically speed. Blue is without using a neural network and green is with a neural network. So it did speed things up. And now just a couple before and after images. Um, so this is from real subject data. Um, on the left, this is what happened when the patient moved during the scan. And on the right is our reconstruction. Uh, and when we do this, we also get the motion parameters output. And we saw motion right at the middle of the scan, which is when we asked the subject to move. So this correlated well with what we would have liked to see. And then for another subject, um, we were also able to improve the reconstruction uh, using this combined machine learning uh, physics recon and also got uh, motion parameters similar to what we would expect. So, all right, I went one minute long, but uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, here's my email if you have questions.